Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning in Asia Pacific. Uh, good very late evening for some of you joining us from Europe. Um, good early evening in uh, North and South America for the most part. Thank you for joining us uh, on this webinar. My name is Delvin Fletcher, and it's my privilege to lead uh, the International Institute of Business Analysis. We're, for those of you who may not know who IABA is, we're a independent, not-for-profit professional association serving the global business analysis community. And it's our pleasure to host this uh, event. This is the second one that we've done today. It's evening for me. I'm based in just outside of Toronto in Canada. A couple of housekeeping items as we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please put them into the Q&A section in the, uh, in the Zoom panel. And Keith Ellis, who's going to be moderating our session uh, over the next hour, will try to address some of them as we work through the conversation that we're going to have uh, as best we can. And uh, particularly as we can try and hopefully add some of your questions and thoughts into the, the conversation that we've been uh, preparing a little bit with this uh, group of leaders that I'm very privileged to share the virtual stage with. So I'd like to introduce the, um, both our partner in this uh, conversation today and then the people who are gonna be joining us. Um, we're really privileged to partner with uh, SoftServe, an IIBA corporate partner based in Lviv in Ukraine, uh, a technology and consulting firm that has a global presence. And as you can see, a large uh, community of associates across a number of countries, but of particular interest to our, our community here, um, SoftServe has an internal business analysis community of more than 500 professionals that uh, we support a little bit in some of our IBA's work and that are actively involved in the project work that, uh, that they do across the world. And uh, very relevant to kind of our, our, our bigger purpose tonight, uh, SoftServe started a foundation about eight years ago called Open Eyes that's, uh, that's intended to empower people around charitable projects to help raise funds to connect donors and opportunities to volunteer as members of projects teams. And it's our privilege as IIBA to, to join with them today to use kind of this simple setting of, of some dialogue around some relevant topics in, our, in the business analysis community, also as an opportunity to just help uh, their work. Uh, obviously, they're a, uh, an organization that has a very, very strong presence in Ukraine. Uh, and that makes it particularly relevant and poignant for what we're trying to do today. So it's our, our privilege to join with SoftServe and, and the team. And I know there's some uh, a number of members from SoftServe on this call as, uh, as they were earlier today as well. With that, let me introduce this very august group of, um, of panelists. And I'm very privileged to welcome the five current and former chairs of the IIBA Board of Directors uh, who have served our community over the last decade. Keith Ellis, who is going to moderate for us today, is a past chair of the IIBA board and currently the chief engagement and growth officer for IIBA based in Western Canada. Uh, Michael Agello is a past chair of the IIBA board based in Melbourne, Australia. Good morning, Michael. I'm Barbara Karkenord is the current chair of IIBA's board. Barbara is based in the United States, but currently in London in the UK, so having a very late night. Uh, on this second session we're doing. Ken Fulmer, who is a past chair as well, based in the Eastern United States of the IIBA board and also my predecessor as CEO of IIBA is joining us. Hi, Ken. Michele Martado, who is past chair of IIBA board uh, is based in Milan, Italy. So also in a very early time in the morning for us. I really appreciate Michele, you joining us. And it's uh, it's a great privilege to, to welcome this uh, this group to our our uh, virtual stage. I'm not so sure this group has ever had this kind of event before where we've all been together in a, uh, in a single conversation about some relevant topics. So it's a, it's a great honor to be part of this. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Keith to get us started. Thank you, Delvin. I appreciate the, the introduction and I'm not sure how many times in my life I'm gonna be called August, but I do appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> What I want to do is 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 bring this around quickly to the other speakers, um, to the the panelists, and and we were um, brought this opportunity to to discuss today because of soft serve, and we we you know as as things developed in in Ukraine, we approached soft serve and said, what are some of the things that we might do to assist you in your business analysis community? 
and, and spend some time and perhaps, you know, do some activities. And they said, well, look, we want you to draw attention and, 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 and take the time to do a, a fundraiser to, uh, to support the, the community. We thought, wow, that's really interesting. So on the screen in front of you are a series of places and QR codes that you can use to scan as the, uh, uh, to, uh, over the course of the session. And, and I'm gonna encourage people to use those QR codes as we go forward. But it's, this is a really interesting opportunity for us all to get together in support of, of our global community. So what I wanna do is, is kick off starting with a question from SoftServe because they asked the difficult ones coming through on this one. And so what I think I'd do is maybe I'll go around as I see them on the screen here and start with maybe McKaylee with this one. How would you, so this is, here's a scenario. You, you start with, um, you know, resistance to change. You know, you can have management resistance to change. McKaylee, you could have employee resistance to change. And, and you've got to overcome that hurdle. It's challenging, right? As people kind of look at things, they don't know where it's going to go. What approaches would you recommend to help overcome that hurdle? What are your thoughts on that, Michele? Thank you, Keith. And uh, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to everyone. People do realize that uh, the entire world is changing, but uh, still some resistance to change exists. As business analysts, uh, our definition is that we are change enablers. So our main role is to support this change. And uh, these are basically the advices that I would like to give to the business analyst. When you support the change, you must consider that you need to support change at different levels, top management level, middle management level, and also at the bottom of the organization employee level. So some advices for supporting the change at, for, for a top management level. Here, you must act mainly as a strategic business analyst um, in the sense uh, that is uh, described in the bubble guide in, in, in strategy analysis area. Show them some models of change and customize those models to the context. Propose top managers a roadmap and show them that risks are properly considered and under control. Speak often with them. Help them communicate the change in the organization. And there is also an important aspect that uh, you should consider. Sometimes where organizations are in the middle of a change, you can easily see people at top management, they will try to move from their roles and try to enter in a lower level role. So as business analysts, we have some responsibility in explaining them that they have to stay in their top management role because they have many things to do and it's important they stay there to give direction to the change. As for middle managers, you must make sure that the vision described with the top manager and the roadmap of changes properly communicate to them. Make sure that feedback is understood and incorporate. Listen to them, support them in planning, communicating and controlling the change. Planning is one thing that I have seen is always missing when, uh, when there is a change in, in, in the middle. Help the middle manager to access to assess the existing resources and to balance the workload for their resources. And finally, for employees, make sure that the vision and the roadmap of changes properly communicated. Make sure their feedback is understood and incorporated, listen to them, to make sure that also their needs, personal needs are addressed properly. Engage the ambassadors, those employees that are ambassador of the change, engage them to influence other people. Then related to training, training or leadership might be important for all resources. When you are in the middle of a change, leadership is important at all level. 
but also you must invest a lot in transparency and communication. You must understand that change should happen iteratively. So make sure that you have continuous improvement mechanism and system in place. These are my suggestions for business analyst, uh, Kit. Thank you, Michele. I think that's fantastic. I heard a lot of pieces there around, you know, managing and making sure you're supporting the right layer in the organization, slightly differently at different places. Communication came up very strongly in what you're talking about. I really loved what you're talking about in, in terms of transparency. You know, I think I'm going to come around the circle a little bit to Michael Agello. What are your thoughts on the same one? What what approaches might you might help to overcome some of these resistance hurdles that you see out there? Well, hello everyone. Uh, it's a it's a good morning for me in Australia, and thank you uh, for having me here. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Wow, Michaela, great opening. Um, I was nodding my head and uh, as you were talking and uh, so much uh, resonated with me. Uh, in my career, I've seen uh, that the professional BA can in fact be a leader through facilitating shared view of the vision as you talked about. The professional BA can also facilitate a shared view of what success looks like, a shared view of what expected the outcomes, the expected outcomes should be. And as professional BAs, we know that the great BAs can ask great questions. And as you mentioned, Michaela, it's about communication. And if we listen to the answers of our great questions of, uh, of our colleagues, of management who are resistant to change, if we listen carefully, we will get an understanding of their perspective. And perhaps with through empathy, if we truly listen, we can then. Uh, work together to create a shared vision of what the future should look like. And then we can work together to transition to an agreed state, future state. So that's always worked for me is to uh, work together on a, you know, on, on a basis of mutual respect, transparency, and a shared understanding of what success looks like. Thanks, Keith. Michael, I really appreciate that. You can see everybody here taking notes as you're talking, you know, talking about the professional BA and asking great questions and really establishing that shared vision along the way. Just some great ideas along the way in, in, in terms of, you know, now as people have questions, please put them in the Q&A area and we'll try to pick them up as we go along um, to, to, to people. So why don't we come around, um, you know, I think, Barbara, this one might be kind of fun for you. How can a business analysis professional position themselves to enable change? What are your thoughts on that? And you're on mute. I did Thank that. Thank you. <laughs> we all do it once, right? We're all guests, but we're on mute. That's the issue. Yeah. Thanks, Keith. And, and welcome to everybody. Thanks so much for joining us to help support Ukraine. Uh, I think that obviously the, um, the way that we position ourselves is to continue to build our skill sets. So um, learning, constantly learning new techniques, whether they're in the Bach um, or other techniques, um, even in different areas, different industries where we can get some education. And, and I really feel like uh, as McKelly was talking about um, being able to talk to executives about what's going on with the change uh, is really important. And to do that, I think we need to be very informed and not only about our own company, but about what's going on in the rest of the industry and the rest of the world. So staying on top of current events, especially within your industry, um, listening to webinars on some topics that maybe are not directly related to your job, but give you a broader perspective so that you know, when you have the opportunity to talk to people and, and face a change that's coming up, you'll have all kinds of knowledge that you can share with people um, to help make them more comfortable. Uh, I think uh, Michael said it really well about having empathy. We, we have to remember that um, a lot of people don't like change. Um, BAs do tend to like change. We, that's what we're all about. We like to see organizations grow and improve. Um, and even when it's uh, an unexpected change, we kind of embrace it. 
but most people don't. They don't like change. They're going to resist it. And we can help them um, by having a positive attitude about it and by encouraging them to consider the good opportunities that a change can bring. Um, I know we're all familiar with a lot of the challenges the pandemic brought, um, but you know, some opportunities also came from the changes that we had to make in the pandemic. And so taking advantage of those is a great BA skill, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, so there's a lot of soft skills you're talking about in there around empathy and, and really making sure that you resonate with the audience, know where they're coming from, but also some points made around talking to the execs, being informed, really valuing the lifelong learning. I love the ideas in there that you're bringing out, Barbara. Why don't we come around, Ken, the only true August one amongst us all? <laughs> you know, Delvin, I'm going to bug you about that all of the thing here, so... <laughs> Then why don't we come over to you and, and talk to the same thing. You've studied this profession for so long, right? And, and, and followed and led. How do you feel business analysis professionals can really position themselves, even from a personal perspective, to enable that change? Well, I'm gonna leverage some of the comments that preceded me and say, I totally agree with Mike Kelly's uh, notion that at different levels of influence. So if you're a project level person, certainly influencing change within your project as well within your reach. And there it's about understanding what is the business outcome that was intended and making sure that as value is reevaluated and change orders are processed or new user stories are developed that they, they fit how to get that business outcome. As the strategic level, it gets much more complicated. And I, I think later we'll be talking about that. doing that in light of radical change, you know, world events and pandemics and supply shortages, all that is coming up. But I was going to talk about, you know, make a real more in depth point about the communication issue that um, several people, especially Barb, made about the importance of communication. I had an opportunity at Sunoco, which is was at the time the fourth largest US oil and gas company in the United States that uh, I was uh, an executive for. And um, the CEO and chairman of the board was also on the board of a very large multinational uh, chocolate candy company. And uh, they were implementing SAP and it kind of didn't work out. And they were they had this realization in August of that year, and their big season for delivery was September through March, uh, through the holiday season where candy is a big, big deal. The bottom line was they couldn't get the candy out the door. They were getting it shipped from the plant to the warehouses, but it wasn't get distributing to distributed to the customers. So they sent me out there with the the notice of us being on the board of this company, but the chairman of Sunoco was really, his interest was, was he gonna get sued? Uh, you know, Was he negligent in his oversight responsibility? So he deployed me out there for about a month to dig deep into what went wrong and was you know, any of the board members at fault or what, did, what was the underlying root cause of the problem? Well, it turns out that the root cause of the problem wasn't the SAP package, the resolution that was brought forward had it didn't change a thing in the SAP implementation. So SAP, you know, had done a credible job. The contractor, which is a big multinational firm, also did a credible job. And it really got down to the people in the warehouse where the you know candy is actually shipped to the customer. They weren't communicated to effectively. You know, like they got emails, but they didn't deal with the change issue. So the product codes, the order codes, the shipping instructions, codes change with the change of systems. They were still using the old codes. So they were building up product from the plants, having to rent commercial warehouse space to stash it all, but they couldn't get it shipped out to the customers. It was just building up and building up. And so this failure to have effectively communicate and effectively use communication to drive 
proper change associated with the system implementation took them to the verge of bankruptcy. It got that bad, you know, that the cost of the warehousing and the lack of getting revenue streams from the customers had a dramatic impact on them. And yet the change was so simple and, you know, really was a misstep by the people, you know, more in the change management part of the organization, which included a lot of BAs. They just missed it. And so, you know, the moral of the story is be totally inclusive in the communication and make sure it's understood. I think that point's been made three times at least. It's not just saying it, it's making sure the audience gets it. Inclusive in the communication and make sure it's, you know, understood along the way. You know, couldn't have said it. I remember doing one myself, Ken, where everybody was just bug-eyed about the change until you step back and just said, here's what you used to do. Here's how it used to work. In detail, here's how it's going to work today. And just start stepping through step by step by step to understand. In fact, uh, Tina is basically joking with you saying, were some of those transitional requirements missed? Yeah, I think in this yeah. case here, maybe a few of them were missed along the way. Welcome, Tina. Yeah. And just by the way, to Tina's point, make sure you do put your questions into the Q&A area because we can pick them up as we go. If we don't pick them up during the session today, because I know we have you know, hundreds of people in the line. If we can't pick them up, we'll make sure that we get back to you before the end of the week with some answers. And please remember, you've got a, a, a great event here and a great opportunity to support Ukraine. And please use the QR codes that are on the screen in front of you. Um, I think I'm going to come around, Ken, and, and just stay with you because I know that you've done a lot with IBA and really working toward this idea of strategy analysis and you opened up with that at the beginning of your commentary just to begin and then dropped into a little bit more detail around project work but when you step from the you know back into the strategy analysis that you mentioned at the beginning of your commentary what, what do you think is the role of you know the business analysis strategist to understand and lead change from a high level particularly as we're looking at a lot of these world events and some of these transformational things that are happening uh, at a world level. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks, Keith. I had to unmute myself again there, so sorry for the delay. Uh, the, the strategy level and the practice of business analysis is, you know, it's, it's not the majority of what people are doing, but the work at that level is so critically important. Uh, so if you say that, you know, a number of people practice at that very senior level, their impact on strategy can be substantial. And in the face of change, it, it really can be dramatic. I mean, a, another story from my days at Sunoco was the impact that the 9-11 event had on our company. It was dramatic in that everything stopped. So we completely focused on that event and how to respond. I mean, we had to do everything from find out where our people were that were spread out all over the Middle East and um, in Europe and, uh, and around the world, figure out how to get them home when every airplane in the world was grounded coming into the United States. And so we had like, you know, those kind of operational details, but we had, you know, the longer term impact was once that was you know, the immediacy things were figured out. It was like, how in the world, you know, when our executives saw that paper blowing down Wall Street, thinking about the impact that has, they immediately made a decision. We have to go digital. We can't be vulnerable to losing our key buildings uh, where, where so many of our transactional and corporate records are kept. We have to get them out, you know, and spread them out and make them digital so they can replicate easily. So we went through a very radical change and we used our BAs as we paired them up with the process owners and put them to work on reprioritizing what had to be done to get us digital in less than a year, um, which, you know, given that we had seven, 70 major processes to redo and some of them required building new application extensions, many of them required like a scanning solution and 
um, you know, a DocuSign type approach put on documents for approval process. Um, there were a lot of things that had to be orchestrated and that event triggered the deprioritization of other projects, but it was really around uh, coming up with a new and immediate strategy uh, as a result of events. And the BAs were absolutely essential in doing that and understanding clearly that the priority was all of the process had to change if they were tied to a vulnerability of paper and to that building. And they, they went so far as to say all the filing cabinets in all our facilities had to go. It was no longer acceptable to keep any file cabinet. Wow. You, you know, any processing that was done was done off your desk and scanned or recorded electronically and then disposed of. Um, so that was a really, you know, BAs radically changing the fundamentals of 70 major processes in a great haste. So I think that's as close as I had in my prior experience to seeing the impacts of things like the pandemic and war and, you know, supply shortages and, you know, uh, energy crisis things that we have going on right now and very much tied to the theme of our conference with the impact of war. Well, you're really talking, Ken, to a complete, enabling a complete sea change in culture, right? Moving from um, paper base as a culture that things it's okay to be filing things to, we now need to be digital and we need to do it in a year. How are we gonna do it and how are we gonna change the processes to enable that cultural shift? What a tremendous story, Ken, I really appreciate that one. Now, I know Michaela, you are equally passionate about this idea of strategy analysis. This is one of your big areas. And I thought, you know, I think you could put a lens on this right down to that personal level, like Ken's talking a little bit more organizationally, you know, talking about how that shift can happen. Maybe you could talk a little bit more from a, a personal level, how business analysis and specifically that business analysis professional can really get down in there and, and help lead that change from a strategy analysis perspective? Well, I first of all, I totally agree that uh, these broad changes are increasing the importance and the role of a strategic business analysis, business analyst. I do definitely understand that and I support that. Um, as I said before, as a strategic BA, we should support our client in understanding the uh, the change that is happening in a context and what problems and opportunities will originate from this change. Uh, I spoke with some friends who have business analysts and they, for instance, referring to the pandemic situation, they clearly uh, understand that the impact of this pandemic uh, can be with us, can stay with us for decades. And nobody knows what the the result what the impact will be we don't even know what will happen in three months time from now but we know that it would be huge impact for 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 the next 10 years already so it's important that we understand that and we need to move step by step uh, change is should happen iteratively Make sure that transparency and continuous improvement mechanisms are in place. You don't have any other chances to support the change. I'm not saying managing, it's impossible to manage, but really support this change. That this, this is what, what, what the role as strategic behavior is. Speak to your to your client. Show them, help them to model the future states, the, the the new organization. Where do they want to go? What are the values they want to build? The new organization. Define a change strategy. Support them in prioritizing and planning the change. So these are my opinion how a business analyst can support this change. I like it, you know, like so much about the discussion here, iterative, focused, you know, in terms of where you're going. If you were to pick on one or two, or just to elaborate one of those key messages that you think really need to 
stick home for people, Michaela. What one message in there might you pick out just a little bit and 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 make sure, hey, look, if you take one thing away from that, what would you what would you put your finger on? Um, you must understand that change represents an opportunity for new discoveries. And uh, a friend of mine, he was an experienced business analyst, always used to say me these words. On the journey of change, you should avoid those people who always know the route, who always know the way, or the risk is to never getting lost. <laughs> I love it. That's fantastic. It's like navigating uncertainty. That's what we're about. Remember that one piece. And I think that people exactly. are going to take away that story. We have one here, a question that is purpose built for Michael Agello. I'm going to come over to you, Michael, on this one. It's coming in from Carl, who says, I often see organizational change breaking down between strategy and execution. And the projects get bogged down. You get, you know, inertia or inertia or risk. How can we help organizations get better in that layer between strategy and execution? Michael, I think you're pretty darn well suited to answer that one. Uh, it's a great question, and I'm very grateful to Carl for asking that question. Strategy to execution. We've seen that uh, throughout our careers. Uh, I certainly have where organizations uh, get passionate. Uh, it, we come from a good place. Organizations are so excited and passionate to make a difference, implement change, and we often fall into that trap of jumping from strategy or strategic idea and straight into solution mode. And we bypass a whole lot of critical thinking, critical analysis that must and should precede execution. Mm -hmm. And so there are a number of strategies that uh, organizations and the leaders of organizations uh, really should adopt. And uh, that critical thinking and uh, Michele and Ken and others have touched on it, that strategy or strategic analysis that uh, precedes execution. Uh, there's, there's IBA is itself has published a strategy to execution literature. And uh, there's critical thinking that must go must must uh, precede uh, execution. I could talk about this for a, a long time. I know. <laughs> I I'll, know just, I'll, I'll just I'll just pause there, and uh, if, yeah. if people want to ask more questions, feel free. That's or good. Just talk to us offline. Well, and I, I want to combine one of the questions that's coming in from Chi uh, Chi Huau. Woo, sorry. And with with another one that I see on the screen as well, there are all kinds of disruptions. And and she was talking in terms of you know international politics and a lot of change in in, in the areas. But you know, Barbara, they could be mergers and acquisitions. It could be legislation. It could be a financial crisis, fuel crisis. I had a luggage crisis recently. Although that <laughs> fits on the same scale as what you know, we're facing here. How can organizations be proactive in preparing for the future? What are your thoughts on that? It's, I think that's a great question. And I'm also looking at um, Arvind's um, comment in the Q&A about one of the challenges we have as BAs is we are influencing without authority. We typically um, sit in places in the organization where we're not maybe at a director level um, or above. And, and he's asking, how does one influence change when not everyone might take your role seriously? And, and I do think this is one of our big challenges. Um, we, we need to step up and begin to behave as leaders. And leaders do not need to have official authority. Leaders are people who articulate a clear vision and help people understand how to get there. And if you do that, people will follow you. Um, I, I think in a lot of our governments today, we're really lacking leaders. We have elected officials, they're not leading. Um, that you know, They're looking out for themselves in a lot of cases or maybe a very small constituency, but they're not stepping up and, and really giving us a vision and, and goals that, that we could follow. And, and that's why part of, I, I think part of our world is, is struggling so much. 
Um, and, and I think this is the point where BAs are the ones who can really step up and say, hey, I've thought about this. You know, I've, I've put some analysis into my thinking and here's something that we can do. Here's something that's going to be valuable to our organization in terms of making us more flexible or agile or, you know, all the words, the buzzwords that kind of go around. But it's really just the fact that we stop after a crisis and take a moment and think about it and not be reactionary to kind of do the first thing that comes to somebody's head. Um, and, and I think training your organization to do that is a, is a way to get your organization prepared for some of these maybe unexpected changes, is getting everyone in the habit to just stop for a moment and think, right? What are the alternatives? What are the options? Let's not do the first thing that comes into our head. Um, and, and we're all guilty of that sometimes. You know, people at the very highest levels of organization sometimes are reactionary. And they need us to just remind them, hey, let's take a breath and, and let's, let's think a little bit about what we might do and where we're going to get the most value. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I really love this. I, I did hear from someone just recently I was talking to and he was a mid-level executive and he said, oh, BAs don't want to be leaders. And it, it, it hurt my heart. You know, I said, yes, we do, you know. Um, and, and I think we haven't done a good enough job of, of showing that maybe outwardly because we tend to be, we don't know everything. So we feel like, you know, hey, we can't lead. But guess what? Um, most BAs have very good instincts and have really good ideas. And, and you need to speak out and share them and, and people will follow. Yeah. Uh, I, Barbara, I just loved what you're talking about, the difference between leadership and as authority. And in fact, you know, as I think about my own self, as soon as you step into leading through authority rather than leading through the skills of leadership, you're in trouble, right? So it's this is very, very well said, you know, in terms of there's a difference there and that you need to be thoughtful about change. So why don't we come around to Michael Pagello? I haven't talked to you in a minute. So let's let's come back over there and, and pose the same one. So you know, how can organizations be more proactive in preparing for future disruptions? What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I'm glad to come to me, Keith, because I have been thinking about this. <laughs> and, um, and I am reading the commentary and uh, from, uh, I, I can see Australians are up and about uh, in, in this morning. So for me, it's about three main points, and I will touch on some of those comments, is up front, and, and Barb and others have mentioned it, it's about um, a boring task, uh, a boring technique in the body of knowledge. Sometimes I, I feel it can be a little uh, overlooked. It's risk analysis and management, risk analysis and scenario planning, and about being proactive, identifying risks, doing that analysis that Barb talked about, and then taking the time to prepare proactively uh, for the management of risks, you know, including mitigations. So risk management. The second thing for me, again, we've touched on it earlier. It's about building organizational capability and being prepared, planning and rehearsing for these disruptions. Now, we don't know. We haven't got a, a crystal ball, but we know there will be disruptions. So it's about identifying people, roles and processes and have them ready, lying in wait, so to speak, and rehearsing for these disruptions. And then, of course, as Arvind, I think, pointed out around uh, building relationships. Absolutely. It's about investing in people. And that's the third uh, thread, I think, about being proactive in the event of change. Investing in people, investing in relationships, building capability, building competencies. And that, with that comes confidence in ourselves, confidence in each other, confidence in our teams. And with that comes trust and then resilience for change. Well, we don't know what's coming around. McKayley said the pandemic, for instance, could be with us for 10 years. And, we don't, and yet we don't know what's around the corner in three months' time. However, BAs of the world, if we invest in ourselves, if you invest in yourself and you grow yourself and be the best you can be, I suspect you'll be more resilient and you can deal with any change. And as I say, change, bring it on. 
I am ready. And together we can make a leap forward and be the leaders we need to be. Wow. Bit of passion there. I always look to you for the passion there, Michael. It's I, I thought that your 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 approach, you know, start with proactive risk management, build the capabilities, visualize the capabilities, invest in those skills, make sure people have those core skills to be able to execute when you get pushed into the corner, when you get pushed to the wall. Those are the foundations that you need to start looking at as organizations. And and I thought, you know, why don't we you know, SoftServe asked us to go forward with this event and has posed some very challenging questions along the way. And I thought, why don't we pick up another one of Oksana's and Nadia's questions? And, and we'll be coming back toward the close of the session to, to Nadia as well. But you've asked a challenging one. You've got an unprecedented or catastrophic change that's happening. And let's just, let's just paint a scenario, all right? You've got an unprecedented or catastrophic change that's happening. It's unpredictable. You got no idea where it's going to go. But you really need to secure your business. You need to protect those projects, and you you don't know, and you don't know that people might be suffering that larger consequence. Can I get to come to you? All right, the statesman out there. Why don't you give me three or so? steps or decisions you might take for the business, a business owner, or a business analyst when you're faced with that kind of scenario, that kind of catastrophic scenario? What are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, I've gone through a few of those things. So uh, the lesson learned is focus on the event first. Um, and so if the analogy is your house is on fire, it's not the time to do a risk plan it's time to drag out the fire hose and put it out. Uh, and then look at, you know, the, the next stage is do the risk analysis to prevent it from ever happening again. Uh, so risk analysis is critically important. And e even if you had done it and something totally unexpected, like a bomb drops on your house uh, could happen uh, that you're never prepared for in the planning process. So uh, that would be step one. I think the other that is implicit in some of the things is if you're in the middle of a project, if you're working at the project level, at the initiative level, um, it's too easy to get defensive and say, how do we you know, keep the project going? And maybe the right answer is it's not that. It's maybe that project needs to be killed. Maybe the value proposition is now so weak, it's not worth continuing or there are way better places to make investments to execute um, the offsets to the risk plan. You know, what do we do to put in those preventative measures maybe is a better investment than any ongoing project. So I think that's the step two. And step three, I think, is to, you know, reprioritize things based on that value. Um, it's around how do we look at the portfolio in total. Before I mentioned this, you're looking at it from the individual project point of view, and it's worth continuing, but also step back at the portfolio of all investments that an organization makes, all you know, major spending and say, are they all right under these circumstances of emergency? Can they be deferred? Can they be you know, less money spent on them for now and break them into phases? There are a lot of options of how to respond to it. But to go through that exercise of a portfolio replanning of what is the work and how is it going to get done and with what level of funding to move it forward. I think those are in the faces of a crisis. Those are the right steps to take. Yeah, you can't get defensive. You've got to understand those priorities and you can't get defensive about this isn't one. And then looking at that portfolio replan and say, what do we do next? Keith, Go ahead, Barbara. I, I just wanted to add on to that because I agree with Ken the, about the portfolio rebalancing. And, and that made me think it sort of ties to this idea of becoming a strategic BA. I think being a portfolio manager at, or being at that level where you're helping the organization choose projects and figure out what that priority is, that is a very good strategic BA role. 
um, because we understand value, we understand how to do business cases, we understand uh, how big things are, how complex they are, and we can help the organization make really good decisions about what they should be working on when. Uh, I see most of the organizations that I work with have too many things going on and they're not finishing many of them yeah. um, because they're having such a hard time prioritizing. And, and I think the BA skill set is the perfect skill set to help do that. Michael's laughing at me. <laughs> well said. <laughs> Very well said. I want to take a minute before I come over to Michaela and because I want to pose a similar question there, but we have a question from Tina and the only one here that can answer it is Delvin, because Delvin is the one who got to experience the Rogers outage and you and I were talking about this one. Uh, one of the very, very large um, telcos had a massive disruption shutting down their entire network. So Delvin, you know, how could an organization better prepare against something like that entire network going down? What could we do differently? I thought you and I had a great conversation on this. Let me put it over to you briefly to uh, to talk about that. And we got to go to Michaela. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, I, I think it, it, it that uh, that outage that happened in Canada and basically took down 30 or 40 percent of the communications infrastructure in an entire country for 30 or 40 hours was was as illustrated a lot of things, you know, <laughs> a little bit of contingency planning is never a bad idea when it comes to technology infrastructure, especially when you're reliant on cloud systems and and you know in, in our situation at, at IIBA thankfully uh, smarter people than I had done that work beforehand. Um, and therefore we were able to deal with a lot of it without kind of the pain that maybe some other organizations had. So some of what we've talked about in terms of, of risk management and planning becomes crucially important in that kind of situation. But I think this underlines a bigger issue that, that has kind of been woven through some of the comments that we've, we've been, I've been listening to uh, over the last half hour or so. And it's also kind of one that, that Liza, hi Liza, touched on in her comment that sort of rolled through in the Q&A a little while ago, which is how do we put ourselves into leaders shoes when something critical, something crucial, something impactful, something unplanned happens, right? And, and I was, I've been thinking about that, Liza, since I, I saw your comment a few minutes ago. And I think the, the leaders that I have worked for and had the privilege of learning from over, for, over my career have had two common themes that I can think about when they are in crisis or when a crisis happens or when something that they didn't plan for happens. The first is they must make decisions. And the second is they don't have enough time. They don't have enough time to research. They don't have enough time to gather the best data. They don't have enough time to weigh options. They have to act. We touched on this in some of the commentary a few minutes ago. And I think there is no better environment in which business analysis can contribute meaningfully if we are willing to tell the truth, to stand up with courage, to connect the work that we are doing to whatever the outcome or the crisis of the moment is. I think that's our opportunity and it, and it happens it happens every day, but it especially happens in crisis because what leaders that I've worked for want more than anyone, anybody else in the organizations that they lead is people that they can rely on to tell the truth in a situation with insight, with understanding, with data, right? With the kinds of things that we are kind of, we're wired to do that work well if we're willing to stand up and, and, and be present in those kinds of situations, because leadership to some degree is the art of making the best decision in the moment with imperfect insight, imperfect analysis, imperfect risk management, imperfect data, because not making a decision is usually gonna be worse, right? And I think that that's the one theme that maybe unites a lot of these conversations, whether it's 9-11 um, or, a, shipping container in the Suez Canal that goes sideways for a week or a telco outage in a particular country. You know, all of those bring that same thing to the table that I think we're in a position to really contribute to. Yeah, I agree. Well said. Now, Michaela, I want to come around to you because, you know, this idea of what do you do in around this unprecedented or catastrophic change, something that's unpredictable. What are some of your thoughts on those key steps or decisions that you would take for the business analysis or the analyst, bring it down to that analyst level. What are your thoughts there? Um, well, Keith, we, I'm, I'm thinking of what happened with the pandemic when all companies in the world were locked down in 
24 hours, completely shut down. And they were running, executing project and people were immediately dispersed. Uh, in this situation, you have to count on your people leadership skills and, and on, on the competencies. So my three key points are the following. Ensure the real priorities are reset properly and communicate to everyone. Invest in increasing communication and transparency at all levels. That means you must have the right technology and tools. Make sure the managers are behaving more as leaders than manager. Move them from command and control to a sort of servant leadership, let's call it this way. And make sure your employees are empowered to make decisions. Great, Michele, I really appreciate that. Now I wanna make sure that we have enough time here uh, Delvin to come back to Nadia and Oksana to, to close off the session tonight. So what I thought we would do is just go around and, and have one quick thought. What's one closing thought that you want to, to, to leave behind? And, and it touches back to this discussion going on and titling here, Carl and others are having, no matter what that title is, what are your thoughts? And then what would be that kind of closing thought that you'd have for people today in this session? What could the business analysis professional do to drive better business outcomes? Michael, I'm gonna start with you. One short thought that you would leave behind, one. Prioritize the essential items. We've got the underlying competencies. So professional business analysis, professional BAs around the world, let's demonstrate courage be the leaders that we can be and help our organizations prioritize the essential items. Yeah, wonderful idea. Barb, what's your thought? Michael uh, took my thought, uh, be brave is, is my thought. We, it is kind of uh, frightening sometimes to step out and, and state something um, that maybe you're not 100% sure of, but you probably have very good instincts, so go with them. That's fantastic. It's just be brave. I, I, you're going to have to do a webinar on that for us. Michele, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, business analysts, are, we are change enablers. This is the role, the title that we have in the bubble guide. And uh, I would like to see the business analysts as the guardians of change for this change to happen positively for the organization and safely for all people impacted. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Now, Ken, I have to come around to you. A lifetime of service, still working in the Philadelphia chapter. What are your thoughts to close out today? Uh, the one, uh, and there was a comment that was uh, made that my thought is, the BA practice needs to get um, more diverse in its analytic tools. And so if we're gonna make an impact on change and on strategy, we need to look at things, not just the internal processes and internal objectives of a company, but I think it needs to change and pivot to a new start point that starts with the customer and what any kind of change does for them, whether it's an immediate urgent pandemic situation or an evolution of change. It has to start with the customer, then move to the suppliers and partners and employees, but it can't stay focused just on what the executive wish list is for what they want to achieve based on their internal view of the organization. That, that's kind of my summary thought. That's great. I mean, uh, I, along a similar lines, you know, there's a wonderful uh, a turn of phrase that we picked up in one of our research studies that you can be super busy as an organization. In fact, you could even be incredibly productive as an organization. But if you're not really aligned on strategy, what's it for, right? Are you really taking the organization forward? And that is so much driven by understanding what is valuable to the enterprise. What a great session. I just loved listening to 
preliminaries here today and, 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 and take a whole lot of notes along the way. And I, I want to turn it back over to, uh, to Delvin, if you could help us close out the session today. Thanks, Keith. And thank you, Michael and Barb and Michaela and Ken for sharing your, uh, your thoughts and some of your experience with it. I'd like to just give these last few minutes uh, to help us wrap up to uh, Nadia Trubb, who leads the business analysis office at SoftServe in Lviv. Nadia, just share a few thoughts with us as we finish today. Thank you very much, Delvin. Thanks to all of you for joining this event and being so active. Let me dedicate next couple of minutes to my homeland. As you know, Ukraine is the biggest state in Europe. Its size is 604,000 square kilometers. As of now, 20.7% of our territory is either occupied or annexed by Russian Federation. By June this year, Russian Ukrainian frontline has reached 2,450 kilometers. This is twice as much as distance between Washington and Quebec. Those are just data, just numbers. However, real people, millions of Ukrainians are living behind this data. Children and adults, civilians and defenders. Unfortunately, no analysis can help us in this case of hardship. Neither business analysis nor data or system analysis can solve this riddle. Because this war doesn't have any rules, doesn't have predictable decisions or anything logical that we all as, bus as business analysts used to work with. For the almost five months, the only thing that each and every Ukrainian can do is to fight on her or his own front line and stand, stand united as a nation. Because we fight not only for our freedom, our dignity and peace. We are fighting for values of the entire democratic world. On behalf of SoftServe, global company with Ukrainian roots, let me express my sincerest gratitude to you, to IBA, to Global BA community for your invaluable support. Thank you all for staying shoulder by shoulder with us. Glory to Ukraine, glory to our heroes. Thank you, thank you very much. Nadia, thank you. And thanks everyone for joining with us. Um, have a good day or good evening and take care. Bye-bye everyone.